Shockwave is the villain you'll love to hate when he captures, kills, and tortures anything that gets in his way. Who will be his next victim? Let's find out in Transformers number 10 from Image Comics. See you in three. Transformers number 10 is the kind of comic that feels relatively solid and consistent with the series from start to finish, but readers who've been on board since issue number one may feel this issue kind of lacks a little bit of oomph. It could be that the choice to spend half the issue on Beachcomber's backstory is just a creative choice that maybe was a gamble that it won't pay off, maybe. Or it could be that a journey without a destination is starting to show those little bits of hairline cracks in the series. Overall, it's a good issue, but maybe not our favorite. When last we left the Autobots and Decepticons and Transformers number 9, the situation got a whole lot worse for Earth when Soundwave completed the construction of an interstellar portal that allowed the infamous Decepticon general Shockwave to join the fight. Thankfully for the Autobots, Alita 1 fled through the same portal with the barely living Ultra Magnus before shutting it down. The issue concluded with Optimus Prime being forced to flee the battle, grudgingly leaving Cliffjumper and Jazz behind. Meanwhile, Auto Train kidnapped Spike, but the boy is rescued by the arrival of Beachcomber. That brings us to Transformers number 10. We begin with a flashback to the Decepticons and Autobots brawling aboard a ship in Earth's orbit millions of years ago. Beachcomber was ejected from the ship during the fight, sending him crashing to the moon's surface without a hope of escape. Eons later, Beachcomber escapes the moon eventually when he stealthily hitches a ride aboard Apollo 11 during humanity's first moon landing in 1969. True to Beachcomber's name, Daniel Warren Johnson leaves him marooned on a different sort of deserted island. How Beachcomber gets marooned makes sense and adds details to how the Ark crashed on Earth millions of years ago. That said, the method of Beachcomber's escape to Earth comes off as silliness that almost succeeds by the rule of cool. At the risk of putting on my nerd hat, the Apollo missions were carefully calibrated and measured feats of engineering. So there's no way Beachcomber would have been able to hitch a ride without crashing the lander or driving it wildly off with his body weight. Again, I know it's a very nerdy nitpick, but it's one of those ones where if you're going to pick on a famous historical event like the Apollo 11 landing, it's required that you get a little bit more accuracy in there to make it make sense. Somehow, Beach Cobra makes it to a tropical island to enjoy the sights and sounds of nature for the next 65 years. When his sensors pick up the presence of the Ark somewhere elsewhere on the planet, Beachcomber travels on foot across oceans and continents, apparently somehow, to find the ship embedded in a mountainside with all the occupants deactivated. Beachcomber had the opportunity to wake up the Autobots, but he chose not to. In the present, Beachcomber explains this information to Spike after his rescue with Autotrain, while Autotrain sits nearby chained up. Johnson uses Beachcomber's backstory to develop his character as a soldier who's grown weary of war and fighting, converting him to a sort of pacifist monk. The character work further plays on the Autobot's name as someone who prefers the laid-back, easygoing life of peace. Strangely enough, Beachcomber is the Transformer that now seems the most different from any previous iteration of the character, which may or may not be a problem depending on your need for source material reverence. We switch over to Shockwave and Soundwave talking aboard the Nemesis on the ocean floor. Shockwave is pleased with the news from the Constructicons that the portal has been repaired and is more powerful than ever. Soundwave, however, is preoccupied with the desire to repair Ravage, who was damaged in the last battle. Shockwave chastises him for not staying focused on the bigger picture and snatches up Ravage to be thrown into a nearby recycler. Before Ravage's damaged body is crushed into scrap, Shockwave is suddenly distracted by a surprising sight from one of the Nemesis windows. He spots a pod of blue whales swimming in the waters near the barrier that keeps the water away from the ship, and he marvels at the majesty of the gigantic creatures. His awe, unfortunately, because he's a villain, turns to glee when the constructive cons activate the portal's energy feeder intake and sucks in the pod of blue whales to be destroyed and converted into energy. Johnson uses the scene with Shockwave to go for pure shock value, true to his name as well, as a cheap trick to underscore just how ruthless, callous, and evil Shockwave can be. However, just because it's a cheap trick doesn't mean it doesn't work. Yes, it works, turning Shockwave into the villain you'll love to hate. I mean, who doesn't love whales? Who's going to hurt a whale? Shockwave's going to hurt a whale. Elsewhere, Optimus Prime makes it back to the Autobot base where Wheeljack has the hydroelectric dam configured to start generating Energon. The reunion, however, is bittersweet when RC sees that Alita 1 has arrived with RC's longtime and long ago mentor, Ultra Magnus. That's a good thing. However, the happy moment turns to grief when Wheeljack learns that Jazz and Cliffjumper were left behind and Ratchet was destroyed in the battle. Again, Johnson is masterfully playing with complex emotional themes. 
In one scene, Johnson creates emotional highs and lows while establishing complicated conflicts for Optimus as he's constantly burdened with the consequences of his choices made in the heat of battle. In this way, Johnson creates a stark contrast in the atmospheres between the Decepticon and the Autobot camps. The issue concludes with Cliffjumper and Jazz facing torture at the hands of Shockwave, possible unrest in the Decepticon ranks over their own decision to leave soldiers behind, a tense conversation between Alita 1 and Optimus Prime over past decisions in the war, and a massive new arrival which we won't spoil here. For all the back and forth and ups and downs, especially with Beachcomber, the last scene, and we're not going to spoil it here, practically dispels any misgivings with a huge wow moment you won't see coming. Johnson gives readers a planet-sized cliffhanger that demands your attention, which is how every comic that has anything to do with action and adventure should end. No, before you ask, it's not Unicron. So you're going to have to wait to see what happens in the next issue. Let's switch gears briefly to talk about the art. Jorge Corona and Mike Spicer continue to impress with dramatic visuals, energetic action, pitch-perfect figure work, and character designs, and an all-around fantastic-looking comic. Again, we had some you know minor misgivings about Daniel Warren Johnson rolling off the art duties after issue 6, but Jorge Corona has done a fantastic job picking up that baton and running with it. Let's take a step back and look at the bigger picture. Transformers continues to be touted as part of the Energon interconnected universe, and it's right there on the credits page, so you can't miss it. But so far, there's no presence of G.I. Joe beyond Duke's very brief appearance way back in issue number 2. We know the government and military are actively interested in handling the quote-unquote giant robot problem because we see that in all the connected G.I. Joe titles, but wherever those crossover plans are intended to show up, you've yet to see those seeds planted in this series. So final thoughts, what do we think about Transformers number 10? It's another strong entry in the series with good backstory on Beachcomber's whereabouts, an emotional roller coaster, especially for the Autobots, and a massive cliffhanger. Daniel Warren Johnson's knack for creating powerful and complex moments is on full display. I mean, I don't think there's anybody out there right now that does it better. And the art team's output is fantastic. However, the beachcomber portions of this issue are a little odd and maybe not our favorite thing in the world. Therefore, we're going to give Transformers number 10 from Image Comics and Skybound an 8.5 out of 10. This isn't our favorite Transformers issue, but it's solid all the way around. But, you know, let us know what you think. Give us a thumbs up if you're a fan of this series or Transformers in general. And if you have different ideas about the issue, leave a comment below to tell us what you agree or disagree with. Also, remember to click on the link in the description to read the full review or buy a copy of the comic if you so choose. So thank you very much for joining and stay tuned through the outro for more reviews just like this one.